Safety is a way of life. In the workplace now more than ever, we believe people in leadership have a responsibility and duty to build and foster a safe work culture. In this podcast, you will have the opportunity to hear from industry leaders across transport, logistics, insurance, agriculture, and construction. They will share their insights and personal learnings around subjects of workplace safety, compliance, organizational culture, crisis management, and regulatory changes to be aware of. At the end of the day, we want to ensure that everyone makes it home safe. Remember, work hard, work smart, work safe. The Safe Work Podcast is proudly brought to you by Curialign. Curialign is a cloud-based safety and compliance management platform aimed at proactively helping organizations to be safety compliant and enable safe working environments for its people. The three capability areas of the software are safety on the go, safety compliance management, and safety compliance tracking. Curialign. Safety and compliance made simple. Brilliant. Well, uh, thank you all for joining us on yet another episode of the Safe Work Podcast. My name is Daniel Alexander, and I am joined today by Greg. Greg, how are you today? How are you doing, first and foremost? I'm, I'm very well. Thanks for having me on. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm very excited for today's conversation. Um, But before we get into everything, I would love to have you introduce yourself, tell people um, who you are and where you're from. Okay. Uh, My name is Greg Huff. I'm based in Bendigo in Victoria. We have a consultancy business here where we manage and assist uh, the industry with accreditation. We've got about 1,500 clients uh, and we've got about 12 staff. And we support the industry, a lot of farmers, a lot of operators in maintaining compliance with the accreditation, access permits and anything heavy vehicle related. Uh, Prior to commencing starting this business, we've been in operation for about 12 years. Uh, I used to work for Vic Roads, the state authority in Victoria, and I was the manager for enforcement for Northern Victoria. I had a lot of other roles. I was there, I was at Vic Roads for about 15 years. So the information and the knowledge that I've gained and a lot of the staff with our business are also ex-Vic Roads or police. So we've got a lot of understanding of the compliance burden, uh, how the legislation works, that sort of thing. So what we've, our business is sort of flourishing because the reality is in a lot of cases, the industry is struggling to find the information related to heavy vehicles. Mm. Uh, In the last five years, a lot of it's been delegated to the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator, which is based in Brisbane. Their role is to try and simplify transport and have one set of rules. Uh, they're having difficulty getting the states on board. States have got their own priorities. Uh, they can't really demand or command that the states follow the national framework. It's getting better, but there's still a lot of inconsistency. So that's a lot of our business. Um, wow. Previously, people could go to their state road authority for heavy vehicle questions. But nowadays, if you go to likes of Vic Roads, they'll... They'll try and answer the best they can, but they generally will then handball you to the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator, which have a great website, good staff, but it's very, very complex uh, and they're really struggling in the industry. That's why we're so busy because we answer their questions. Uh, We have to answer their questions. We can't say it's a grey area. It's all in the legislation. It's all there. It's just a matter of of, we have to knuckle down and find it. So we're very good at that and that's why we're, we're growing year on year. Brilliant. Well, I am so excited for being able to chat with you today, and I know that this will be very helpful for people across the industry here in Australia um, and and as well at large around the world, because these conversations need to be had. And and specifically today's conversation, we're going to hone in on mass management, what it is and what that looks like and how how your company actually plays an incredible role in seeing that managed and, and also obviously facilitate and helping to actually deploy um, the certifications and audits and things like that. So we'll dive into uh, the subject matter today, uh, but I'm very, very glad to have people like you in this industry because um, the need is so prevalent to be able to actually answer questions. Lots of times people turn around and they, they just don't know where to where to go. Um, uh, so thank you, number one, for putting your hand up to uh, do what you do on a daily basis to to manage and also help 
safe roads be something that all of us can enjoy as we uh, go about our day-to-day lives. So first and foremost, that question there, what is mass management? Okay, so mass management is one of three voluntary accreditation modules uh, administered by the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator. It's been around for about 25 years, so it's not new. Uh, Previously, the states used to administer the accreditation modules. It's basically quality assurance. So transport companies can sign up uh, and be then accredited under the separate modules. So there are three modules. There's mass management, which provides extra payload. So the trucks that could normally allow to, say, take 62.5 tonnes can take up to 68.5 tonnes. So there's, each scheme has benefits. There's also hurdles that, you know, the companies have to jump over and minimum standards that they have to meet. It's voluntary, um, but generally there's a benefit for the company. So, Matt, there are mass management for weight. So in, in the regulatory area, mass is about the mass of the truck. So it's all about axle yeah. weights. There's maintenance management and there's uh, fatigue management. So normally, well, in Australia, most countries have statutory limits for weight. So to make sure that the assets within the road, bridges, culverts, pipes, pavements are protected from overloaded trucks, the government sets upper limits. That's always been the case. Uh, if the industry was left to their own devices, they'd all run you know, very, very heavy trucks because it's about yep. making money, which, so there has to be limits. So the government sets limits. Yep. So normally uh, a limit of say 62 and a half tonne on a standard B double, if they're accredited, they can go up to 68 to 68 and a half tonnes on the basis that they meet certain criteria and that they put in controls and systems in place to ensure that the, the weight of the truck is known. So, right. and, so that's mass management, which I'll come back to. Maintenance management means that people have systems and processes in place to manage the safety and maintenance of their vehicle and trailers. Yep. Most people are doing that now. It's a, the industry has come a long way in the 35 years that I've been involved in it. Um, so maintenance management, if, accredit, if people are accredited, in some states they're required to have an annual roadworthy or safety inspection by their state mm-hmm. road authority to renew the registration. If they're on maintenance management, they don't have to do that because wow. they're, seen, they're deemed to be uh, have a certain safety systems in place, things like a pre-departure check of the truck, uh, a fault report process that's a circular process so that we know you know, that the fault is reported, it's fixed, it's tested and then reported back to the driver. Uh, so you've got those things in place for maintenance management. And fatigue management, there's always an upper limit, similar to weights, yeah. speeds, any other thing. Um, for fatigue, drivers of a heavy vehicle, what's called a fatigue regulated heavy vehicle, are limited to 12 hours in any 24-hour period. So they can't work, which is drive, load, unload, supervise, do paperwork associated with a truck they can't do for more than 12 hours in a 24-hour period, which is quite a lot anyway. Um, But if they're on fatigue management, they've got to have medicals and do some additional training and the companies have got additional controls on their work uh, and their fatigue state, and then those drivers can do up to 14 hours. So that's fatigue management. So they can do up to 14 hours in a a particular day based on the the controls and the systems and the processes that are in place at the back end by the operator. That's brilliant. So they're three modules. So if we now go back to mass management, because that's what we're here to talk about, to get mass management, there's a few steps that we have to get across. So the Mm -hmm. the, And the main one, it's all about the management of the weight of the vehicle. So before they enter the road network, the system says that the driver or someone has to assess the weight of that vehicle to ensure that it's not over the limit and there has to be a record of that process. Now, that can be a weigh bridge or it could be equipment that's fitted to the vehicle that measures the air pressure in the air systems. A lot of the later model trucks these days and trailers have air suspension, so it's managed through an airbag system. So those systems are plugged into a a, a process that records the pressure in the air gauge, which can be calibrated and give a weight. So that's the common way to do it. So the drivers load the truck, they access their weights, they document that record. So there's got to be a documented process. That can be on a paper-based system or on an app or through an iFace on the truck. There's different ways of doing it. They do that before they enter the road network. And the basis right. is that if drivers do that and they've had some training and, and those processes are calibrated and verified on an ongoing basis, the government has confidence, if the system works, that that truck will not be overloaded. So the benefit yeah. for the company is they can carry extra payload. And a lot yeah. of some sectors are not interested in the weight of vehicles, but 
common vehicle types that use mass are quarry materials, so construction, concrete, sand, gravels, uh, fertiliser, grain, you know, any of these bulk commodities. So they're, they're, most of those vehicles are on mass management in some form. So oh, that's by, brilliant. By having those processes in place, the government says, OK, we'll, we'll allow you to load more. So that's the incentive. Once, so there are a number of controls, and one of those is that the, the operator has to be audited by, the nation, by the, a, a national heavy vehicle regulator approved auditor. So it's a basically a, it's a quality assurance scheme that things are done and every two years a heavy vehicle auditor that they choose and they pay for, they, that, that auditor comes in, it's a fairly straightforward process, they check their systems, they check their weight records and uh, they produce a report and that report goes to the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator and um, the process is renewed. Now having said that, if we come as an auditor and mm. find that the documentation hasn't been done or the drivers haven't been trained, then that accreditation may not get renewed. The normal process yep. would be that the auditor completes a non-conformance report, which says, hey, you haven't done your training, new drivers have come on and they've never been shown what to do. Everyone's busy, things happen. So we then yep. write a non-conformance report and that company's given you know, four to eight weeks to get their system back in order. They then yep. provide the auditor documentation to show that and then they get their renewal through. And there are others that... When we come to do the audits, they haven't done what they're supposed to do and they don't get mm. renewed. So their audit report would show that they're not compliant with the, with the processes. So the regulator will just say, well, you haven't complied, then you don't keep accreditation. So yeah. there's, there's certainly benefits, but there's, 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 you know, there's things that the companies have to do to maintain accreditation or to retain it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I guess a, a question would be for for a business who's looking to move to mass manage uh, mass management, and they look to enlist your company, for example, to come on and and do the assessment and bring about the the relevant checks and balances. Um, how would a company go about doing that? What what would be, I guess, the the first place to start? Look, a typical phone call will be a referral from a client, or through our website, or if someone needs it's a contract requirement, so they'll contact us. Um, you know, they don't really understand what it's about. So the first, you know, meeting might be a phone meeting, might be a hookup or might be a site meeting. We would come down and explain the processes, uh, you know, say what the benefits are, what the, what the you know, the negatives are, uh, and then they make the decision on how to do it or not. But the first meeting is generally trying to dispel some of the concerns or the myths that the industry has. You know, there's a common perception that the paperwork is, you know, very high. Look, it may have been considered high 25 years ago when accreditation started. It was fairly new. And but these days, most transport operators, not all, but certainly the majority, are completing, are fairly compliant. They've yep. got systems and processes in place. The drivers are used to doing pre-departure checks of the vehicles and getting the weights right and that sort of stuff. It's not, it's not rocket science anymore. So we find that in a lot of cases, there's not a lot that the companies have to do to meet the requirements. There might be some tweaking and some additional things, but it's not. Uh, it's not a big hurdle. But, yeah, look, it's generally people are confused. They've sort of yeah. – they'll talk to their friends or their associates and, and then we get involved in that way. Some we decide that it's not suitable for them, you know, the, yeah. you know, the type of work they're going or the areas that they're travelling in because not all roads are approved. So we've got to make yeah. sure that the type of freight and the locations that they're going to are going to meet. It's going to be a benefit. So we, we, it's all about what's in – you know, it's a – what's for them in this. So we need to make sure that it's going to provide the benefit that they need. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's not worth doing. Absolutely. No, that's brilliant. Um, I, and the next question, and this is diving a little bit deeper into, I guess, kind of a use case. Um, uh, the next question I have is, um, are the processes involved in operating under the mass management um, kind of scheme much different to abiding by the normal requirements of chain of responsibility legislation, if that makes sense to you? So chain responsibility is a concept that's been rolled out in transport for about the last 20 years. In 2005, the, the original or the initial what's called chain responsibility legislation was introduced. And it's all the, the, the sort of backstory is prior to 2005 or four, an offence could only be committed by the driver of the vehicle or the registered operator of the vehicle. So as an ex-enforcement officer, you'd pull up a driver the vehicle's unroadworthy. It's not his truck. He's a driver. He's been asking the boss to repair it. The boss is saying, well, we've got no money to repair it. You have to keep driving it. So the driver 
you know, even though he might be driving it, he doesn't have a lot of control over how that vehicle's maintained. He might be under mm. duress and pressure. We've got bills to pay. So prior to that legislation, I could only book that driver for driving an unsafe vehicle or I could go to the company and the registered operator uh, and book him for that. However, in a lot of cases, you know, it was just easier to issue it to the driver and it didn't fix the problem. Mm. Things, and another issue might have been mass management. So overloaded vehicles travelling to, you know, to a site to unload, when they arrived at that site, that, that company that was unloading those vehicles couldn't be held liable. So there was no... So the only way I could over, to, to stop an overloaded truck was to actually locate it, find it, you know, while it's committing that offence, and then mm. I booked the driver for that. So under chain responsibility, they said any, basically anyone who's involved in the movement of freight by road is potentially liable based on their influence and control. So wow. that driver of driving an unroadworthy vehicle that he didn't own and didn't maintain, he doesn't have a lot of influence and control. At the end yep. of the day, he's driving it, so he's liable for some part of it. But under chain of responsibility, it looks to who has control and influence. So the the man, the owner of that vehicle who's paying the bills to maintain it, he has a lot of influence and control, so he's, he becomes more liable. It's gen, chain responsibility legislation is generally only ever used for large or long-going systemic issues. Mm. But if I hark back to the, the, the overloaded trucks, let's say taking their overloaded trucks to a grain receival centre, Yep. In the old legislation, they couldn't, they, they wouldn't or couldn't be held liable. Under the new legislation, they can be held liable because they're mm. allowing overloaded trucks to enter. Yep. So as a result of those legislation changes, everyone involved in the movement of freight is potentially liable based on their influence and control. So yep. that company has clear influence and control. It and, and in response to chain responsibility, most of those larger bunkers and receivers and quarries that are sending trucks out on the road they yep. won't let them overload because they know that they can be held liable. And as a result yep. of that, overloaded trucks going to grain bunkers, it, it's pretty much a thing of the past. Yep. Loads coming out of quarries that might have been able to be loaded out because it wasn't the quarry responsibility. They didn't care. Well, they might have cared, but they couldn't be prosecuted. Under the new yep. legislation, they can be held liable. So they just don't wow. let over, overloaded trucks over, leave their sites anymore. So chain oh, responsibility has had a huge impact, positive impact on compliance. It's created a fair bit of paperwork. That's just the way things are going. Things have got to yeah. be it. But it's there, meant there huge, always is. <laughs> yeah, it's meant a huge increase in, in you know, the compliance. In yep. the old system, you know, you could quote for a job uh, at a certain tonnage and then your competitor might quote for the job at a certain tonnage but then put 10 tonnes of extra weight on their truck and then make their money that way. So it was a dog-eat-dog yep. -dog system. Uh, and pulling up individual drivers one at a time to book them for overloaded trucks, not a very effective way to do that. Yep. Now, the, the bunkers or the companies that are loading or unloading trucks are managing it themselves. So the industry has turned it around completely and, and good on the industry for that too. That's However, fantastic. In, in October last year, there were, uh, they, they made amendments to chain of responsibility. Uh, it, it sort of it certainly panicked the industry and shaken up the industry a bit. The fines have gone up substantially for mm. companies that don't comply with certain parts of the chain of responsibility, put a lot more onus on company directors because at the end of the day in a large company, it's the directors that are calling the shots in relation to training, funding repairs, you know, funding yeah. training, you know, giving people, you know, the resources to do their jobs properly. So the, 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 the new legislation... October 18 puts a lot of onus on those prime, you know, those directors and chief executives and stuff. So it actually it started to rank, ring alarm bells with some of these larger companies and smaller companies. So as a result of that, the industry has taken lots of steps, and the NHVR, the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator, has been very good in promoting, you know, how you can comply. And so the new legislation has. It's, it's an increase on the old process and it's certainly tightened up in a few areas. The fines are quite significant, as they need mm. to be. Um, there are sort of three level of fines, up to $3 million and up to three years or five years imprisonment for a, for a wow. person. Uh, that doesn't happen very often, thankfully, because the industry, in my experience, is pretty good. There's yep. always going to be, you know, people that sort of, you know, do the wrong thing That's and we need enforcement and we need compliance for that. But the industry is much, much better than it ever used to be. I mean, Australia is one of the trans safest transport systems in the world. And yeah. 
but we're pretty good. So we need to be congratulated on that. Absolutely. But we're, but we're constantly pushing for a zero road toll, um, mm. you know, which is never going to happen. But you know, it's it's a, it's a great aim. Yeah. Uh, so it's all backed around safety, protecting Absolutely. drivers, protecting road users. Absolutely. No, that's that's brilliant. The next question I would love to get your uh, and you alluded to this um, towards the beginning of our conversation. But can you can you chat a little bit more about the differences between states and uh, and when operating under mass management as you go from state to state and kind of what people need to be aware of and be looking out for as operators? So, yes, there is the national heavy vehicle regulator. So we've got participating states in that. So. However, Western Australia and the Northern Territory are not participants under the national program. They've got similar rules, but they are, you know, they are significantly different to the Eastland, East, East Coast states. However, Victoria, Tasmania, New South Wales, Queensland, ACT, South Australia and any others that are or Queensland, those states are all participants under the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator Framework. So there are three levels of government in Australia. We've got the you know, local government at a local council or municipal level. We've got state government at a state level and we've got federal government at a federal level. And under the constitution, all those levels of government can make their own calls. You know, they're independent. However, the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator is trying to gain, garner those states that are participating to say, hey, look, let's move freight in one, under one set of rules. Um, let's, let's make, you know, they realise that like let's say an oversized load coming out of Brisbane to go to Adelaide has to travel through potentially four states. Each state has different rules. The same load, the same truck, the same roads, but different rules in each state, mm. which is very, very frustrating for, yeah. for the industry. So the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator is trying to get all these states to deliver uh, and to adopt the one set of rules. And they're getting some traction. However, they can't compel the states. So they can encourage and cajole and, and seek approval but at the end of the day, states still have the right to make their own rules, and they do make their own rules. So we do have differences in all yes. manners, whether it's mass management or fatigue management and all those different um, compliance areas. So generally under mass management, some states uh, re have restrictions on the roads that you can travel on when you're operating at the higher weights. Mm. So there are three levels of accreditation or three levels of mass there's the general mass limit, so that's what the general population of trucks operate with if they're not accredited. And a typical one in the industry will probably understand, like a twenty a, a triaxle group with tandem tyres and um, you know normal suspension can operate at twenty tons. Yeah. If it's uh, accredited, they can operate on all roads at up to twenty one tons. That's called the concessional mass scheme. And then if they're accredited with higher mass limits, with air suspension, a few other conditions. They can travel on the approved higher mass limit roads uh, in those states. However, in, in Queensland and New South Wales, there is one additional requirement to have to have vehicle monitoring, basically, to make sure that trucks who are operating on that approved network uh, are ma making sure that they only operate on that network and they have to have satellite tracking of the trucks. So wow. that's that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's an additional cost. And there's recently been a, a New South Wales have recently acknowledge that the cost to, to, to the industry to have the satellite tracking is, is fairly prohibitive. So they're coming out with a cheaper version, which is basically going to halve the cost. Because the government wants the industry to travel. That we want less trucks on the road. This is not about putting more trucks. If we can get all the trucks on accreditation, we can have more weight on the existing fleet. So we don't need the extra trucks to carry the extra freight that we're yeah. to carry. So, but there, because of the limitations of the network, in a lot of cases we've got bridges and roads that are not able to take the extra weight. Yeah. That those there are limitations, and one of those limitations is what's called IAP, which is the Intelligent Access Program, which is re basically a system where, if vehicles are travelling on these limited network roads, that they have to be monitored so they don't travel off them. So yeah. it's basically a back end system. So the main difference between the states is the access. So yep. South Australia and Victoria have very good access for higher mass limit vehicles, but Queensland and New South Wales have limited access because of their, their network of roads is a lot bigger. Like Victoria, South Australia, they've got pretty good network of roads and, they're, and they're, most of those are approved. But however, in New South Wales and Queensland, because of the large network and a lot of bridges in New South Wales, it's historically yep. been 
they want to make sure that these trucks only travel if they're loaded to these high masses on the yep. approved route. So they have to monitor their locations. Oh, that's that's fantastic. Thank you for that. Another another question would be, um, are there benefits to operating under mass management other than just the payload uh, and, and weight uh, ability that you can actually take as a, as a driver? Yeah. Look, the main driver certainly is increased payload because, you know, the companies are getting paid you know, per weight. Some companies want it because it's good as a third-party accreditation. So we have a third party coming in and auditing your systems. They might not use the mass management, but they know that by having – an accreditation approved by a government body that's gone through a quality assurance process with auditing and you know paperwork and record keeping in place that they can show their clients or their customers that they're accredited so it's basically you know it's a tick of approval so yeah. some companies require it some countries uh, some companies require it for contract purposes they might not use it but it shows good governance so if yeah. you've got those three ticks of mass management and fatigue management and maintenance management you can show your customers that you're, you know, running a, you know, well-resourced, hopefully, you know, well-compliant company that's been accredited by a third party. So you're not just saying, oh, we've got these processes and systems in place. You're actually being audited and meeting certain standards that are set independently. So that's that's another driver for it. It also ensures that we all should be getting our weights right, whether we're on accreditation or not. It's it's an offence yeah. if we overload and drivers can overload because, in my experience, they've never been shown. When I was pulling up drivers yeah. as an enforcement officer, a lot of them had no idea. They hadn't been shown, hadn't been trained. Uh, and, again, they don't have a lot of influence and control. So the legislation, back to that chain responsibility, is saying, well, if you're employing these drivers, it's your responsibility to ensure that you're training them, that you're giving the right equipment uh, and to give them the opportunity if there's any problems to report it back. So a lot of companies use it to ensure that their systems and processes are in place to make sure that the drivers are being trained and they're checking their weights and that sort of thing. Because the fines for an overloaded truck can be quite substantial. Yeah. Um, we had one recently where he was he was overloaded in error. He had a permit. The, the permit was issued on the basis that he had a weight of a, of a large bulldozer of, say, 50 tonnes. It was actually 60 tonnes. Oh wow! It was so it was so big that he couldn't weigh it. So he, he went off the documentations that he was given by the manufacturer of the bulldozer. He got he, he was intercepted and that was weighed on scales by the um, road authority. And was found to be overweight, and the fine that he was potentially going to was the maximum penalty was about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Wow! So the fines are very very substantial for large overloads. Now he went to court. We explained. What had happened, that they tried to do the right thing, that the weight that they were given by the manufacturer was found to be incorrect, that they couldn't weigh it themselves and check it because it was so big and large and wide that they couldn't, there was no way to reach suitable to weigh it. So he ended up with a fine of about $2,000. Wow. Um, so right. it was a lot less than he could have, been, could have been. But if it had been a repeat offence or it was done on purpose, you know, the fines are right up there. And chain responsibility, the fines, which is all part of this process, are quite severe for... You know, repeat offenders. So they've got it. The, the, the legislation is certainly very powerful. If if they find that these operators continue to do it, back in the old day, you could yeah. do it and pay the fine, two thousand dollars or whatever each year on year. These days, it's changed significantly. Yeah, yeah. No, that's and and that's a very unique perspective because um, would that be an example of your office being involved in and actually yeah. speaking? So so then that then displays the value of someone enlisting your services as well um, to be able to be an advocate, I guess you'd say, or a, a mediator with the government in that, in that sense. Yeah. So we, we quite yeah. often get, you know, companies, things happen. People are confused. You know, they, they think it's all right and they go out and they and they drive their overloaded, you know, well, it's not overloaded, like their large um bulldozer or whatever similar to our friend. So in that case, we actually went to court with that client. We didn't plead. We had to plead guilty because he was guilty. He, he, but he did. we explained to the magistrate in simple terms, I attended. I'm not a solicitor, but we just spoke on behalf of the company and said, look, we've done all our things. We thought it was okay. This has happened. We're very embarrassed about it. We apologise. We've put systems in place to make sure it doesn't happen again. And the magistrate, she was very good. And she yeah. said, well, you know, you, you're obviously taking it seriously. It wasn't intentional. And yeah, well, I think we got a you know like a fifteen hundred dollar fine, which it could have been a hundred times that much. Absolutely. So, you know, so that's so that's a lot of that what we do now. Having having said that, if we get a company that rings us and says 
they've got, or a driver that rings me and says he's been booked for doing 130 kilometres down the Yume Highway, well, I'll tell him, yeah. well, don't bother ringing me. You shouldn't be in the truck. <laughs> so, but we don't get a lot of that. But most people are making mistakes, and I found that as an enforcement officer. A lot of them have had no, have got no idea, and that's at, at the end of the day, the legislation says you must know. Ignorance is no excuse. Yeah. You know, a lot of our business is, is answering people's questions because they go to their road authority and they just can't get the information. They go to the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator. They're confused as well. As you wait online or on the phone system at the NHVR, it says that they'll give you general advice, but if you want specialist advice, you need to get your own independent advice. So that shows me that they can't even guarantee, and I suppose they never can, that the information that they're going to provide is is true and correct. So it, they acknowledge effectively that it's that's very confusing. And and again, that's what they're there for. And they're, they're trying with the best of efforts to try and reduce the complexity. Uh, because we have that for one state and because different states have their different rules, that complexity is, 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 is multiplied for each state. So, you know, there's different rules in some areas for each state, which is made, it makes it very, very difficult. But that's, that's why people contact us. Brilliant. And then here's a, here's another question. What uh, what extra office or admin work is there when operating under uh, mass management? Can you speak to that a bit more? Yeah, certainly. And look, that's a big that's a big concern of the industry. We estimate that, and what we say is, we estimate that there's one hour per month per truck on mass management. Mm. So there's so there is it, and we you know it's not a lot. It depends on the on the complexity or the or the um, maturity of the systems that they've got in place already. Typically, an owner-driver won't have, with a one-truck operator, which is still a lot of trucks run by owner-drivers in this country, yeah. they don't have a lot of paperwork because they don't have the time to do it. So we, we, would, you know, that we would implement some minimum paperwork requirements for them. Um, yeah. That's all. Awesome. You know, but in a, in a larger company, we generally see some minor modifications to their, to their daily paperwork for their drivers, we would typically do some training for their drivers at the startup, uh, and then the back end and in the office, someone has to administer it. Someone's got to take responsibility for it. There's generally these days with companies of, say, ten or more truck op, truck trucks operating, that they have someone who's responsible for compliance, which is it's a big burden for the industry. You don't see that in many other industries. So we generally see someone's dedicated to managing the you know the records already. For, yep. for trucks, yeah, so mass management, you know, for some it's quite an easy. But the average that we say is one hour per truck per month. Brilliant. And so that would follow suit with my following question, which would be around what can be expected for drivers as well in terms of the information that they need to provide in, yep. in mass management. Can you talk us through a little bit more? You, you talked about that at the beginning of our session today around the spot checks that they need to do before they kind of Depart. Can you can you speak to that a bit more? Sure. So with mass management, they they the drivers have to do they they should be doing this anyway, even if they're not accredited. But in most cases, they've never been shown, so it's not the driver's fault. It's the employer, or you know, has to make sure that these things are done. So typically, the drivers of a truck will have to they check they load it. It could be palletized freight. It could be a bunker load of grain. It could be fertilizer. So there's different loads put on trucks. They then have to check that load and, in theory, check to make sure that the weights are are, credit, uh, are within the limits across the axle groups. So like a truck, if I, if you picture a six-axle prime mover and trailer, that's as a single steer at the front, a tandem drive under the truck, and then a tri-axle trailer fitted with three axles. So there are six mm -hmm. axles in combination. And the driver has to make sure that the load is distributed correctly across those axle groups, so a six to six and a half tonnes on the steer, 17 tonnes on the drive and up to 21 or 22.5 tonnes on the trailer, depending on what the scheme they're operating on. They need to do that whether they're accredited or not. So yeah. they do that. And let's say that we've got palletised freight on a, on a single prime mover and trailer, and he's checked those gauges and found that the weight appears to be heavy on the trailer. He can then instruct the forklift driver to move some pallets to the front of the load to shift that around to make sure it's right. So drivers are you know, generally doing that sort of thing. Under mass management, you have to do that. They didn't have to record it, so we would. It's either on an app or on a, you know, I face in the truck or a paper-based document. If an owner driver, they record their weights, so they and then they take off, do their other pre-departure check of the truck to make sure that the safety systems are working and the lights are working, and they document that because under the legislation, we need to have records. 
because yep. if it hasn't been documented, it really hasn't occurred in the law. So there's got to be a record. It doesn't have to be a paper record. It could be an electronic record. So they do that and then they take off. Now, it's good defence. If I'm pulled up by enforcement and I've done my checks, I've, you know, certainly in some loads that move, like grain or sand that can move within the body of the truck. So it might yep. leave the site correct and I've assessed my weights. And then as I've travelled, you know, 500 kilometres to my destination with crushed glass for recycling or grain or whatever, it can move. But if, you know, it's a bit of a defence yep. or a defence that shows that when you departed from your loading site that you were correct. So it's good business practice to do these things. And, mm -hmm. of course, if the drivers have had training and they understand what their weight limits are and how to calculate their weights or their gauges or whatever system they're using, if it's wrong, they should ring their supervisor or, or document or do something to make sure that they don't depart overloaded. So yeah. you know, they're the things that drivers need to do. We have a lot of we. I've got a lot of time for drivers. We need them. They're hardworking, you know, people. A lot of them struggle with literacy and numeracy. They don't like paperwork. We know yeah. that. I've been doing this a long time. The reality is they have to start to engage with paperwork and do this because that's just the new way and they are pretty good uh, at sort of adapting to this sort of stuff. But to protect themselves, and a lot of it is about protecting themselves, if something goes wrong, we need to have records that they've done these pre-departure checks, that they've, that they've checked the weights and that they've done the training and that sort of stuff. So, you know, that protects us and the drivers and that sort of thing when, when something goes wrong. But no. we, we are finding that, you know, that, there are new systems that are being, you know, like there's mobile phone apps that these drivers can check the weights. They can have a cursory look around the truck, they check the weights and they document it on the iPhone and it goes into the office as a back end and uploads into a system so they can monitor it back there. So, Brilliant. So there's That's yeah, great. not a lot for drivers to do. A couple of things that they do, they have to carry in the truck what's called an interception report book, mm. which is a paper-based book. So if they're, if they're accredited and they get pulled up by the enforcement and they check their weights or check the vehicle the enforcement officers are supposed to fill out that interception book. As we as auditors coming into a company, we're really auditing records of historical information. Yeah. But the interception report is basically supposed to record what's happening out on the road. So if the driver gets pulled up in a mass-managed truck, he should hand that book out to the enforcement officers and they should complete it. And hopefully it says that, yep, the weights were checked, the vehicle condition was good, the driver was cooperative, happy days, and a copy of that report goes to the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator and it's put on the company file and we see that as operators, as auditors. So we can see what's actually happening on the road. Um, Brilliant. So process. So that's something else. That they, that it, the, the, the drivers generally just have to carry that document and, uh, and reduce it on request. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. No, that's great. Um, uh, the last and final question we, we have is, uh, uh, what, are, what are some of the changes being introduced in the National Heavy Vehicle accreditation system um, at the moment. Can you speak to that? So recently, and this week, so the 22nd of February, uh, the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator have uh, introduced some changes to the to the business rules and standards. So accreditation is run under as a business um, accreditation, business rules and standards set by the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator. They've made, and they've made some modifications. They're not huge. Uh, there's, a, there's some... A few things. The one, the main thing is probably what's called a notifiable offences framework. So if a company is accredited under mass management and there's an overload or something happens that's related to loading, the regulator want to know about that. If there's something, if I'm accredited for maintenance management and one of my vehicles gets pulled up for being defective, as in unroadworthy, they want to know about that as well. And if it's if my driver's on fatigue management and there's something issue an issue related to fatigue that's been prosecuted or an accident or an ear miss or something that's related to the module that I'm accredited under, the regulator want to know about that. And it's a simple process to do that through the NHVR portal. The NHVR now has a portal where all accreditation applications and lodgements are completed, uh, and that's a very very good system. And they've done pretty well to get that up and running. Um, so that's the major change. Yep. Um, there's some minor changes within the business rules and standards, some clarifications, um, the requirement to have an annual inspection if you're on maintenance management um, by a qualified person. That, well, that's a new requirement. But for mass management, very subtle changes, uh, nothing of, of substantial, but will, will require 
people who are accredited to make changes to their you know, systems or processes to meet the new requirements. Having said that, the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator has given us two years to transition to the new requirements. So over the next renewal cycle of 24 months, everyone will have had an audit. And if any of those new standards haven't been incorporated into their systems, they've got they've got till the next audit, which is in two years' time, to, to, to get up to standards. So there's plenty of time to transition. It's not a big deal. Um, system's working quite well. Um, but yeah, there's some minors. So they want to get the, the data, the intelligence from their accredited vehicles. Things like, if I'm accredited for maintenance management, which says that I've got uh, drivers have been trained that we do a pre-departure check of the truck, that the maintenance has been done and documented. If I, if that truck gets pulled up and it's got five ball tyres, well, that would indicate to a reasonable person that the system's not working. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if the system is working, that, that those ball tyres should have been noted by the driver during the inspection. It's pretty easy to tell what a ball tyre is and that should have been reported and that truck shouldn't have been used. But if it's a small defect like a broken windscreen, which can happen, you know, an hour out of, out of the depot, yeah. That's a different matter, but if it's a if it's a, if it's an issue that demonstrates that the system's not working, or that the vehicle's been involved in a crash that you know might be implicated under accreditation, the regulator want to know about it, and that's and that. But I think the main purpose is to gather some data from the accredited fleet. There's about there's about seven thousand operators out there with about fifty thousand vehicles, so that's a good source of information for the regulator to to learn what's happening out in the fleet. And to share that information for the benefit of others who are accredited, so it's a bit of a you know, it's a good networking process. No, that's brilliant. That is brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Greg, uh, for taking time out to be a part of today's conversation. Are there any last thoughts that you'd like to leave people with before uh, before we go? Well, I suppose a lot of people, are, you know, we get a lot of calls. You know, people are. are they don't know where to go to get the information. So I suppose, you know, we have a website that we're, you know, they're happy to, you know, whether you put that on the on the podcast or whatever, they can they can ring us. We've got staff, we can answer your questions. So a lot of it's about information gathering and people say, oh, you know, I'm not sure what I'm going to do it. We don't mind. I mean, we're, you know, well supported by the industry. We've got a lot of clients. And we're happy for people to ring us and speak to us and ask questions. They don't have to be a paying client because they've got to get the information somewhere. But we generally see that once people find an organisation or business like ours that can answer their questions, they are, you know, very happy and quite happy to, you know, to join up with us um, because right. they've, they've, they've potentially spent days getting the wrong answers or the different answers from different departments uh, and they're running around and around in circles and they're, they're totally bamboozled by it. Yeah, yeah. No, brilliant. Well, Greg, thank you so much again for taking time out to be a part of today's conversation and to come on the Safe Work podcast. And we wish you all well, and we definitely look forward to chatting with you again really, really soon. Wonderful. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for tuning into today's episode. I hope that you enjoyed it. Please connect with us on YouTube as well as iTunes and Spotify and anywhere that podcasts can be viewed or listened to. Until next time. Work hard, work smart, work safe.